David Jones trabalha como diretor dos serviços de emergência do, do Spartanburg, Spartanburg County, na Carolina do Sul, nos Estados Unidos. Nessa atividade, ele administra quatro departamentos do serviço de emergência, comunicações E911, gerenciamento de emergência, academia de treinamento dos serviços de emergência e o escritório do serviço contra incêndio. Jones tem mais de 20 anos de experiência em comunicações de emergência, tendo trabalhado em três diferentes organizações. Atualmente, ele faz parte do, do comitê executivo da, da NENA, National Emergency Board Association, tendo sido eleito como segundo vice-presidente em 2003, tornando-se presidente em junho de 2005. Antes da NENA, Jones pertenceu a, aos vários comitês técnicos e operacionais, todos relacionados ao serviço 911, 911 Estados Unidos. Jones é também membro do Comitê Intergovernamental de Assessoria do FCC, tendo sido indicado pelo chairman do FCC, Michael Paul, para representar os interesses do governo local e da segurança pública. Ele atualmente é o vice-chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind invitation to be here and speak with you. I do, however, want to apologize in advance for my American accent. I live in the southern part of the U.S., so I can be even more difficult to understand. Uh, but bear with me, please. Uh, again, thank you. L let me first begin by uh, one of a bit of a personal introduction. Um, I started in the 911 business some 22 years ago. Uh, I needed a nighttime job when I was in college. Uh, so I started in that business, and I have been in it ever since. I have directed three organizations, one in Wichita, Kansas, one in Texas, and one now in Spartanburg, South Carolina. I come to you as one, as a person who has answered thousands of calls for help, thousands of calls from people who need police officers, po people who need fire trucks, people need, who need emergency medical assistance. So that is my perspective that I speak to you today, of one that has dealt with folks when they need help the most, when they are calling you for assistance. So that was, that's my personal introduction. My professional introduction from the National Emergency Associ Number Association, NINA, uh, of which I was elected president in 2003 and will continue until 2007, uh, is one of a, an association, a professional association, where we bring public and private sector together. We bring the public sector at many different levels, the federal level, the state level, and the city and county, the local government level, we bring them together along with the private sector, the manufacturers, the telephone companies, the service providers, the consultancies. All of these people come together for one single purpose, and that is the deployment of a single unified emergency number throughout the United States. NINA, however, in several years, in the past several years, has moved its focus beyond just national borders within the U.S. We have extensive work in Canada. We have extensive work in Mexico. We recently have worked very closely with a public-private partnership in India, where they have been highly successful in the deployment of a single integrated emergency number. So NINA's focus, again, regardless of where in the world and regardless of what that single number digit is, we believe that a single integrated emergency number for all types of emergencies, police, fire, and ambulance, it can only be a very qualified benefit for the citizens of the respective country. So let's talk a little bit about 911 itself, the American model of 911. Again, it came about as a public-private partnership. Uh, the discussions of a single, unified, and integrated number started uh, in the early to mid-1960s. That's when the discussion started, primarily within the fire service. Police service came on in, in just a few, uh, few years after that. In 1967, the Federal Communications Commission and AT&T, which at that point in time was the only telephone company in the United States, uh, got together to actually make 911 happen. On February 16, 1968, the first 911 call was made from Haleyville, Alabama, by the U.S. Senator from Alabama at that time. That was when the first 911 call was made. The White House, under President Richard Nixon in 1973, urged the nationwide deployment of 911, 
And some 26 years later, President Bill Clinton signed into law that 911 is the sole and universal emergency number within the United States. So why has 911 been successful? And it is successful. We have the 99% of the population of the United States has access to 911. 97% of the land mass has access to 911. So why has that been that kind of success rate? First and foremost, because, because it focused on three basic tenets, and that is one of cooperation, collaboration, and good faith. And I'll explain those. Cooperation means that we are going to share our resources and share our assets from both the public sector and the private sector to move 911 forward. We are going to collaborate in that we are going to the sh share the best of our ideas, the best of our technologies, again, to allow 911 to move forward. Finally, we are going to expect a good faith effort on all parties, a commitment that you are going to proceed with your, your, your component of 911, and that we are going to expect that all of us are going to act in good faith. That has been key components of the deployment of 911 throughout the United States and has successfully uh, deployed there as well as in Canada and other parts of the world. So I call those three tenets, that's what I call a shared passion for 911. And again, that is not any one entity that makes those commitment to that shared passion. That is the public sector, all levels of the government. That is the private sector and the various companies. Now, I'm not here to tell you that the private sector is not there to earn a reasonable profit. Let's be perfectly clear. We believe that any private company that, that participates in the one system has a, should have a general expectation to earn a reasonable profit. We're not asking any private entity to come in here and give products away. That is not how it can be successful. If you were to make an unreasonable or unfulfillable uh, commitment like that, you're subject to failure. So we have focused on the right of the private sector to earn a reasonable profit while we move this forward. That has enabled the private sector to, to maintain their commitment to this process. So let's move a little bit into a more technical discussion of 911. And I'm going to refer, uh, again, in 911 when it started in, in, the, in the late 60s was simple use of an integrated emergency number. That's all it was. We quickly realized, though, that there were reasons and technologies that needed to be available to allow us to provide better, uh, better assistance and better care for our constituents. In the early 80s, late 70s and early 80s, enhanced 911 came about, otherwise known as E911. And it allows for three technological advancements for 911. First, it ensures that the 911 call is routed to the appropriate answering point. Usually means the closest, not always, but it will always determine what is the appropriate PSAP or public safety answering point that should answer that call and can therefore get the most appropriate police, the most appropriate fire, and the most appropriate emergency care, emergency medical care, can get there. That is known as selective routing. I want to ensure that that 911 call is answered by the person that can provide the best quality and the most appropriate service. That's number one. Number two is what we call any or automatic number identification. And that is simply a callback ID. Long before caller ID was a part of the commercial product, 911 had that service and we continue to have that service. Why is that important? It is important because as a 911 telecommunicator, my only lifeline to that person calling me for help is that telephone. However, it's wireline, mobile, VoIP, doesn't matter. That is my link to that person. If that link is broken, I want to have a way to reestablish that link if at all possible. So I want their number so I can call them back. And third, and perhaps the most important, is automatic location identification, otherwise known as ALLI. And that is based so I know 
that when you call me for help, that I know where you are. Now, I will be the first to tell you that on the vast percentage of calls to 911, the calling party knows where he or she is at, okay, the vast majority. But let me tell you a very personal story of when it doesn't happen like that. I was a young telecommunicator in Wichita, Kansas. I answered a 911 call one night, and I had very muffled sounds on, the, uh, on, my, on my headset. I couldn't tell what it was. Um, all I could tell was that there was muffled sounds. Um, so I followed my protocol. In 911, we teach our telecommunicators that you always assume there is an emergency until you can demonstrate otherwise. So I followed my protocol. I sent a police officer out. I could hear the police officer calling. I could hear some other sounds when he got there. I could hear him over the telephone. It was still very muffled. What that police officer came across was a brutal burglary and sexual assault that was going on at the time. What had happened was the woman involved had called 911 and then threw her handset, her telephone, underneath her bed. So I was listening to the event. I didn't know what I was listening to, but I was listening to the event uh, through clothes and whatever else was under, under the bed. But because I had that technology that gave me her address, and because I followed the protocol that was established that I'm going to assume that there is an emergency until I can prove otherwise, a man that I hope and I believe is still in prison today some 20 years later because that woman had the thought uh, to get help and we had technology that was in place to enable to do that. It's a very personal story for me to, to try to demonstrate why we place such emphasis on determining that location of that emergency caller, even for that small percentage of the time when they are not able to tell us that. And you're going to hear me talk about that throughout my presentation. So that is E911. So E911 was fairly easy when all I had to worry about was a copper wire, okay? Back in the 70s and 80s, 60s technology, that was pretty easy. We associated an address with a copper wire, boom. All we had to do was build databases, right? We're all familiar with that. We're a telecommunications industry. We understand that. Then all of a sudden, in the 1980s, came the wireless revolution. The United States has an approximate population of 280 million people. The cellular, the cellular telephone and industry association predicts that right now, 180 million of them have cell phones. That means that all of those 180 million people, in addition to the copper wires that they had in their homes and their businesses, now have cell phones in their cars and on their belts, and that means that they can call 911. So, we, th we predicted back in, the early, uh, back in the late 80s and early 90s that we may, it may if, if the growth really continues like we're seeing it, that we may, when the, when the technology matures, we may see a high of 10% of total 911 call volume coming from wireless phones, cell phones. Today, in my jurisdiction, more than 60% of all calls to 911 come from mobile phones. So why is this important to me? Well, there are several reasons. Number one, let's talk technologically. My ability to provide service to you was just degraded by the, by the massive growth of wireless phones. Why? Because I didn't have a copper wire in which to attach an address to. I had to develop a system, we had to develop a system that enabled us to locate callers when there was nothing to attach an address to. So in the mid-90s, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, determined and required wireless service providers to provide location technology. Even though at that point in time location technology had not been developed, the FCC mandated that it be developed and deployed by certain timelines, specifically 1998 and 2001. I must say that those timelines were not met, and they are not met yet today. 
How those problems were, were resolved, however, were through the use of either what is quite frankly somewhat old-fashioned radio triangulation or in most cases GPS technology, a GPS chip in a cell phone that allows when you make a call to 911 for your location to be pinpointed and a latitude and longitude distributed to the appropriate PSAP so they can place you on a map and get you assistance where you need it. Again, my ability to provide service with such a huge jump in wireless growth was actually degraded until the FCC action and deployments started. I wish that I could tell you today on, on the huge success of wireless 911. Unfortunately, that is not the case throughout the United States. As of today, just about 60% of the 911 centers throughout the U.S. have the technology available to locate wireless mobile phones. I wish we were better than that. Why were we not better than that? Because the industry actually was, in its, it was well into its maturation process before 911 became an issue. In other words, 911 was an afterthought. So now let me migrate into discussion on voice over internet protocol, which is probably the key item before 911 today. And that means that uh, the ability for VoIP service providers and, and the whole issue of how are we going to provide voice and data telecommunications over Internet protocol rather than copper wire, again, my same problems. How are we going to be able to locate it? I tell you, it's an easy issue for me. Personally, I have a nice little IP phone in my home. My telephone bill went from, tw went from $85 a month to $25 a month. Why did I do that? Plain and simple. It was cheaper. My family could talk more. But I also understood that there were limitations with that and 911 has to be resolved. The ability on VoIP service to find the caller is still non-existent. It will be resolved. There's no doubt about that. It will be resolved. What we're trying to do is to learn from the wireless issue of 10 or 15 years ago ensure that 911 is at the forefront of the VoIP discussion, the whole issue around IP telephony, and not treat it as an afterthought. We have started this discussion. It started in, the, in uh, around 2002, and it continues today. Uh, last year, about one year ago, uh, the FCC, under the uh, current leadership of Chairman Kevin Martin, mandated that VoIP service providers provide access to 911. That is relatively easy if you are a fixed asset. In other words, like in my case, where I have a broadband service provider that provides my telephone service into my home, and I don't move it around. Where IP becomes very difficult is the nomadic applications. When I can take that same small modem of mine in my home, and I can bring it here, is, is ensuring that I have broadband access and can have the same telephone access, the same telephone service. Am I going to have a general expectation that wherever I travel, I'm going to have emergency access? Yes, I do. And so that means that we have to resolve that. So the FCC mandated that, and, and the technology development is continuing, and it will move forward. So you've heard me talk about these, these fears, if you will, of IP telephony and its impact on 911. Those are legitimate issues that we are going to resolve. I have no doubt about that. Because even though I am nervous of IP telephony, I also realize that it is our saving grace. Because let's face it, all of these new technologies, wireless, and now IP, we have all tried to fit into a legacy 911 system that has not evolved. IP is going to be that evolutionary factor that will allow us to move our 911 networks that essentially are 1960s and 1970s technology, move it forward into an IP telephony based network that will enable us to have a robust, fully redundant, and very reliable networks that can be used throughout the world. I say world because IP has forced us to look at everything from an international perspective because uh, IP is worldwide, it uses worldwide networks, 
It is not anything just local to the United States or any two particular uh, country. So IP is what we call our next generation 911 network. And it is the absolute wave of telecommunications in the future, I have no doubt. So you've heard me talk about these issues. You've heard me talk about the technologies. You've heard me talk about what makes me nervous and what, what, is a, uh, uh, what we are doing well. All of these issues are surmountable. We have proven throughout the world that if you get smart people together, they can resolve problems. And that's what we are doing. That's what you're doing here today, bringing people together, talk about experiences, talk about shared problems and how you resolve them. But if there's any one point that I would like to make today, that it is not technological issues that, that prevent us from progressing. They are not operational issues. They are not public policy issues. All of those require discussion. All of those require thoughtful debate. All of those require thoughtful resolution. But none of those are possible if you do not share a dedicated passion for what you are trying to do. That is the reason why emergency number access in the United States has been successful, because we share a very dedicated passion to making the 911 system the best that we can possibly make it. Why do we have that passion? Because all of us in this industry, private, public sector, doesn't matter. We all have a, an interest in making a difference in the people that call us for help. They call us for help in their most intimate moments, when they are angry, when they are afraid, when they're sick, when they're scared, they are calling us in some of their most extreme moments in their lives, and we want to ensure that we are there to provide the assistance that we are capable of providing. That dated, dedicated passion is what makes that a success. Thank you.